Before we begin, can I remind members that social distancing measures are in place in the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus, and please ask that you take care to observe these measures over the course of today's business, including when entering and exiting the Chamber. The first item of business is portfolio questions. In order to enable all these questions to be answered, I would appreciate short and succinct questions and answers to match. The first item of portfolio questions is justice and the law officers. And the first question is Andy Whiteman. The presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government further to the commitment made by the Lord Advocate in April 2018 regarding raising proceedings against companies and Scottish Limited Partnerships for failure to comply with their statutory duties to provide information to companies' house, what progress there has been and whether there have been any convictions? Lord Advocate. Companies House is recognised by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service as a specialist reporting agency. And since April 2018, COPFS has continued to work with Companies House to facilitate the reporting of alleged offences by Companies House to, to COPFS. Since September 2018, 13 charges under Section 451 of the Companies Act 2006 against 11 individual accused have been reported by Companies House to COPFS. Of these 13 charges, uh, fewer than five have been marked for summary proceedings. Of those which have been marked for summary proceedings, fewer than five have resulted in a conviction, and some are still subject to live criminal proceedings. I express myself in that way because, in order to meet its obligations under data protection law, COPFS does not provide statistical information for groups of fewer than five. As at 10th September 2020, Companies House has not reported any charges to COPFS under the Scottish Partnerships Register of People with Significant Control Regulations 2017, and accordingly no proceedings have been raised under those regulations. Andy White. I thank the Lord Advocate for that answer. I mean, we, we know for fairly certain that there are thousands of companies in Scotland committing offences by not filing documents on time. Many of these are Scottish Limited Partnerships, some of whom are known to have been involved in nefarious uh, activities. Now, the Lord Advocate says there's been continuing engagement, and I welcome that, and I welcome the fact that there be, uh, there's been 13 uh, reports. Now, I understand the Crown Office will only consider criminal proceedings where a report has been made to, uh, uh, by, in this case, the company's house. Does he not agree, however, that it's in the public interest for the com for company's house to report potential breaches to Crown Office as soon as possible in order that he can consider proceedings because many dodgy companies are just being struck off by Companies House with no opportunities, I can see it, for proceedings or investigations or anything to be, to be, to be launched by, by the Crown Office. Lord Advocate. Yes, thank, I, I thank the member for his question. Um, um, it's, of course, uh, for Companies House to decide um, uh, whether or not and when to report alleged crimes uh, to COPFS. Uh, COP, COPFS's continued liaison with Companies House um, includes both uh, specific cases that are reported to the Crown and also uh, more general liaison, including uh, advice to Companies House about the uh, evidential requirements of Scots law in this area. Um, there are a number of practical difficulties which affect the enforcement of these offences. Um, uh, these include difficulties in identifying an individual offender against whom there is corroborated evidence and who can be uh, brought, uh, made subject to the jurisdiction of the Scottish courts. Um, the United Kingdom government has consulted both on corporate transparency and on the law on limited partnerships. COPF COPFS has invited, has contributed to those consultation, that co consultation process. Um, in particular to invite consideration of measures which would support the enforcement of these particular offences. Question number two, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on establishing the public inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the death of Sheikh Ubayo. Government Secretary Hamza Yusuf. Since the announcement of the terms of reference in May, my officials have been working with Lord Brackadale and his team to put in place all the resources needed to make an effective start to proceedings uh, before announcing the formal setting up date for the inquiry. Uh, the key appointments of the Secretary, Solicitor, Senior and Junior Councils to the inquiry have been made. Uh, work continues on the appointment of assessors and identification of suitable premises. I continue to liaise closely with Lord Brackadale and of course will provide Parliament with further updates in due course. Mark Ruskell. 
Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that update? Um, but can I ask him to confirm the potential misconduct proceedings promised to the family by the Lord Advocate in the event of no criminal proceedings against the officers involved in the detention and restraints of Sheku Bayo? It would appear that the Crown Office has not passed the file on to Police Scotland and to await another further you know, three to four years for proceedings to be considered would be intolerable for all involved. Cabinet Secretary. I would suggest to, to, to Mark Ruskell that he uh, should write to the Lord Advocate uh, on those matters. Uh, my uh, job was, of course, to uh, instruct the setting up of a public inquiry uh, that will examine the facts of the death of the tragic death of, of Sheikh Obayo. Uh, that will do that in a public way. Uh, it will be transparent. Uh, and therefore, if there are issues as a result of that public inquiry, uh, then, of course, they can be examined fully uh, thereafter. But in the issues that Mark Ruskell ra raises, uh, I would suggest to him that he raises them directly uh, with the Lord Advocate. Question number three, Keith Brown. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it's done on the role of poverty and trauma in the lives of young people who enter the justice system. Cabinet Secretary, Hamza Yusuf. We have uh, undertaken and supported a range of analysis, including research into the background of those in Pullman Young Offenders Institute and Scotland Secure uh, Care Centres. In May 2018, we published evidence on the links between childhood adversity and criminality. Uh, the need to end poverty was also highlighted by the Independent Care Review. Uh, the evidence shows that understanding the impact of trauma and providing the right support can have a hugely positive impact in Scotland, we've seen a dramatic change in the youth justice sector, including an 87% reduction in the number of under 18s in custody uh, between 2006 and 2019. We're committed to continuing to reduce these numbers and to developing trauma-informed approaches and reducing child poverty. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? He'll be aware that in Clipmanager, in my constituency, which has significant challenges in relation to poverty and levels of adverse childhood experiences. And despite the often ill-informed comments about young people we see in the media, not one person under the age of 18 has been sentenced to imprisonment or admitted to secure residential care since 2015. Does he agree with me that the whole system-based approach developed by the Youth Justice Service in Clipmanager is effective and delivers better outcomes for our young people? Well, the member raises uh, an exceptionally important point and, and some fantastic efforts by the local stakeholders. And let me pay tribute to all those involved in this vital work in the members' constituency uh, and indeed right across Scotland in turning people's lives around. They also minimise the number of future victims. I think that's what we forget when we invest in people, whether it's young people or indeed not so young people, in terms of rehabilitation. Everybody wins out of that. Society wins out of that uh, because there are less victims of crime. And since 2011, we've seen major sustained reductions in the numbers of young people across Scotland being referred to court and being sentenced to custody. Uh, we're committed to, to learning from good practices in areas like Clack Manager and applying that across Scotland uh, with confidence that the whole system's approach uh, gives us a sound method. Uh, we remain determined uh, to make even more progress. Um, so I'm delighted that the members raised that particular local issue and I know many other local authorities will look towards Click Manager uh, to, for, for, for that good practice. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government in the light of concerns regarding the term likely in relation to hatred being stirred up in Section 3 of the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill, whether it is reviewing that phrase. I'm sorry, yes. Christine Graham uh, will have heard uh, last week's debate, and I thought it was a very good debate, and I thought the tone of the debate uh, from right across the chamber uh, was very good. And what I promised to do and committed to do uh, in that debate, and in fact, I committed to do this before the debate, uh, was to listen to all the stakeholders involved, uh, those who are critical of the bill, uh, those who wish to see some changes and amendment to the bill. Uh, they are being listened to and will continue to be listened to. Uh, and yes, uh, you know, I'm looking at all of the sections of the bill, but I can confirm I'm also looking at, of course, uh, the stirring up offences, which include uh, the likely threshold uh, in terms of stirring up uh, hatred. So I can confirm that is one area uh, that is being explored and looked at. And of course, I will come to Parliament uh, with an update uh, in very short order, I hope. Christine Graham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, because I think he's right. I think that there broadly is support across the Chamber for the principles of the Bill, but that phrase does cause concern. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to consider that essential requirement 
or ingredient in a crime that is intent or mens rea, because likely to, in my view, does not meet that test. Government Secretary. So, as, as, as I say to the member, I am listening carefully to that uh, comment and, and com comments, similar comments that have been made around the stirring up offence. Just in, in, in perhaps the counter argument, if I may, uh, is that we have had a racial stirring up offence now for almost 35 years. Uh, that racial stirring up offence threshold is behaviour that is uh, threatening or abusive or insulting. It has an additional threshold, but also is not just intent only, it is also based on uh, potential for likelihood of stirring up hatred as well. Now, that law has operated for, as I say, almost 35 years in Scotland with, as far as I can see, almost no controversy uh, whatsoever. Uh, so there is an example we can look to, and hence why the protections we're looking to afford uh, others, other vulnerable groups and other protected characteristics, is broadly based on the racial stirring up offence. It's not exactly uh, a mirror, but it's broadly based on that. Notwithstanding all of what I've just said, uh, this is an area I am exploring. I've committed to the Parliament, particularly uh, I know the Liberal Democrats were pushing me on this to come to the Parliament well in advance of when the Justice Committee is due to take uh, oral evidence. Uh, I will do that, and certainly this is one area that I will explore and look at closely. Supplementary question, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary. I think it was a good debate last week, but following the revelations this weekend that the Hate Crime Bill has received the largest number of written responses in the history of devolution and that the Justice Committee was not in fact aware of this when agreeing its timetable, does the Cabinet Secretary now consider that a sensible way forward might be to fundamentally rethink the approach to the stirring up part of the bill and thus ensure that the other parts can be sufficiently scrutinised and legislated on to tackle the pernicious hate crime we all wish to address. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank Liam Kerr uh, for his question and the tone uh, of his question uh, as well. I thought the arguments that he was making around timing, I could understand where he was absolutely coming from, but I hope you would also understand the counter-argument, which I thought was best articulated by Victim Support Scotland, that if we delay this bill beyond this parliamentary term, those who need the protections the most, and I think we would agree at a time where the atmosphere can be very febrile, very hostile for minority groups, then they will be waiting even longer for that. And therefore, for me, my commitment is to come to this parliament as soon as I can, before the oral evidence stage uh, at Justice Committee with some proposed changes. It will then be for the parliament, and ultimately the parliament will decide what the timetable of this bill should be. I am in there, I am beholden uh, absolutely to them. In terms of his, the first part of his question about this being the most controversial bill, and there was uh, so many submissions, 2,000 plus submissions uh, to the bill, uh, my job is, is, is not to, to avoid criticism. My job is to make uh, sometimes extremely difficult decisions uh, and, and make sure that we have legislation which will be both effective and also in this case, of course, protect people's rights. And I go back, back to that quote by, uh, uh, the American uh, author, uh, Albert Hubbard, uh, which says to avoid criticism, uh, do nothing, say nothing uh, and be nothing. So I think actually we have a job not to avoid criticism. That is not our primary aim. Our primary aim is to make sure as legislators we pass good legislation uh, that protects people in this case, but also protects the freedom uh, of speech as well. Supplementary question, Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much. Can I uh, thank the Justice Secretary for uh, confirmation that he has responded to the call um, I made in last week's debate to come forward ahead of the Justice Committee Stage 1 uh, oral evidence with proposed changes to particularly Part 2 of the Hate Crime Bill. I noticed he's uh, referred on a couple of occasions to coming forward to Parliament as soon as possible. I wish I could, uh, hope I could press him a little more on, on when and how he intends to, to come back with those proposals to Parliament. Uh, again, again, ultimately, these will be uh, decisions for the Parliament and the Bureau uh, to take. My, my proposal, my suggestion would be uh, doing another ministerial statement. I think that would be the correct uh, approach to take because it would give as many members as possible uh, the chance to ask questions uh, and scrutinise what I'm bringing forward. Uh, if, if, if the Justice Committee wished me to come to the committee uh, thereafter, uh, I would be more than happy, uh, certainly, to do that. Um, uh, what I'm looking at uh, in terms of timing, uh, again, I would have to speak to parliamentary business. They would have to speak to the Parliamentary Bureau uh, and get agreement from parties across the chamber. But ultimately, I'm looking to do this as soon as I possibly can to give uh, the Justice Committee as much time as possible in advance of oral evidence. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the statistical publication Domestic Abuse and Stalking Charges in Scotland 2019-2020. Government, sir. Well, let me first reiterate and be clear in the message that myself, the First Minister, the Chief Constable, 
Lord Advocate and indeed many others right across government, uh, I hope, have been very clear and right throughout uh, this pandemic uh, and indeed uh, before that domestic abuse and stalking will not be tolerated in our society, but particularly during these unprecedented times when we know there is a greater potential danger uh, for victims. Uh, regardless of local restrictions, uh, our response remains unchanged and we encourage victims to come forward uh, and to seek help. Uh, the domestic abuse and stalking charges in Scotland 2019-2020 referred to uh, by the member. That publication provides an early indication that Scotland's new domestic abuse laws are encouraging victims to come forward and report these crimes while providing police and prosecutors with greater powers to target those who engage in coercive or controlling behaviours towards their partners or indeed uh, their ex-partners. It's worth recognising that an offence which may have previously been reported as an isolated stalking charge may now, where appropriate, be included as part of a course of conduct of domestic abuse under Section 1 of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018. It's worth noting that the publication covers a period up to the end of March 2020 and does not reflect the full COVID lockdown period. Uh, we remain committed to tackling all forms of gender-based violence and will introduce, parliamentary legis uh, introduce legislation to this Parliament on domestic abuse protection orders within this parliamentary session. Angus MacDonald. Cabinet Secretary for his, uh, his answer. Um, we know these crimes can have a devastating impact on those affected. So can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber how many uh, police officers and staff have been trained to identify signs of coercive and controlling behaviour? And can he also outline how the new domestic uh, abuse bill will build on these protections? Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I thank um, Angus MacDonald uh, for, for that question? Because the training for police officers was a really integral part of making sure that we got this bill right. Um, there would have been potentially unintended consequences uh, if we had uh, enacted the bill before that training uh, had taken place. Um, to answer this question directly, um, more than 14,000 police officers uh, and staff across Police Scotland completed the Domestic Abuse Matters uh, training. Uh, further to this, training of around 700 domestic abuse champions will sustain change, identify and address good and poor practice as well as support uh, and, and offer guidance to their peers uh, as well. In terms of the very last point in, in, in his question, uh, as, as I mentioned and as announced by the First Minister in the Programme for Government, uh, the bill uh, that we are uh, looking to introduce will impose restrictions on a suspected perpetrator of domestic abuse, including removing them from their home they share with a person uh, at risk and prohibiting them from contacting or otherwise abusing the person at risk while the order is in effect. The bill will also uh, facilitate where appropriate processes for changes to be made to social housing tenancy agreements to help victims stay in their own homes by giving powers to remove perpetrators from tenancy agreements. So these measures are intended to further protect uh, people at risk uh, of domestic abuse and enable them to take steps to address their long-term uh, safety and particularly in relation uh, to housing. So I uh, will look forward to introducing that bill shortly and I hope it will command the support of this parliament. Question number six, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President of the Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what account it takes of the impact on people who have booked holidays when determining which countries to add to its list of those where people must self-isolate for 14 days when they return. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am, of course, sympathetic to the impact of the Borders Health measures on holidays. Uh, I know the Member will understand, of course, our overarching priority must, of course, be to protect public health. Uh, decisions on additions and removals from the country's exemptions list are based on the latest evidence available about the number of cases, about transmission, about the importation of risk, uh, the in-country controls, and a range of other factors uh, as well. We're continuously keeping the list of country exemptions from the quarantine requirements under review, but it is based on public health and the risk that international travel may well pose to that. Uh, this does mean, of course, that the list of exempt countries can change relatively quickly because the situation in a country can change at quick notice. As the First Minister and I have said previously, our advice to people right now has to be to think very carefully about non-essential foreign travel, given the gravity of the situation that the world is facing. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Whilst I agree with your comments, Several of my constituents have been refused total refunds for their holiday, which they cancelled due to their particular country destination being added to the 14-day 
self-isolate list overnight. Companies say they can only refund for actions taken by the UK government and not the Scottish government. In your view, does the Consumer Protection Act or any Scottish law not cover my constituents? If not, why not? Pardon me, sir. So a, a couple of points I would make. First and foremost, where we can get four nations alignment, that is something we strive for. In the vast majority of cases, uh, when it comes to countries, we, we, we manage to, to get a significant degree of alignment, uh, I'm afraid, and on certain occasions we won't. And that won't be for any uh, malicious reasons. That will be because, uh, for example, the data of inbound transmission in cases in Scotland may be different to the picture in Wales or Northern Ireland or, or indeed England. So it's for very understandable reasons. Uh, and there never uh, certainly uh, isn't from my end uh, any concern where we don't manage to align uh, with other countries um, in, 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 that, in that regard. In terms of uh, the more detail of his question, uh, I mean, the operation of any air service is, is a matter for that individual airline. Uh, quarantine requirements and indeed even FCO advice they don't actually prevent an airline from, from operating any flights. Um, the Scottish Government itself doesn't have the power to prevent flights uh, from operating. Uh, passenger rights in relation to aviation are covered by European regulations, which in the UK are overseen by the CEA, the Civil uh, Aviation Authority. Uh, there's further information on passenger rights available on the CEA website. Um, although the regulation of consumer protection is the responsibility of the UK Government under the Scotland Act uh, 2016, the Scottish Government has taken on responsibility for consumer advice and advocacy. Uh, the Scottish Government funds a consumer service that provides clear, practical advice on all consumer issues. Your constituents may therefore wish to contact Advice Direct Scotland and their contact details are online. Question number seven, Linda Fabian. To ask the Scottish Government how it continues to monitor the issuing of non-harassment orders by sheriffs under the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018. Government Secretary. The 2018 Act makes it mandatory for the court to consider in every case whether to impose a non-harassment order to protect the victim. The 2018 Act also provides that where such an order is not made, the court is required to explain the basis for that decision. Uh, there is a statutory reporting requirement in the 2018 Act, which requires the Scottish Ministers to publish a report on the operation of the Act three years after its commencement. This will include information on the number of non-harassment orders made by the courts uh, in domestic abuse cases, and this information has been closely monitored so that, be, so that it can be included in the report, and that will be published shortly after April 2022. Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, and uh, note that last year, um, a, a similar uh, parliamentary question here in the Chamber, I was pleased that uh, there was agreement to look into this uh, I am continuing to hear reports that there is an apparent reluctance by the courts to issue NHOs, despite there being a clear presumption in the 2018 Act. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he's aware of this? Is it in fact the case? And how this is being addressed by the Government, the Crown Prosecution Service and the Lord Advocate? Well, can I thank Linda Fabiani, first of all, for uh, her persistence in raising this issue because it is important. And I know when the Act was, or when the Bill was going through Parliament, uh, yeah, Linda Fabiani uh, took an active interest uh, in standing up for uh, victims uh, of, of domestic abuse in this regard. Um, in terms of uh, my own consideration, we are closely monitoring uh, the numbers. Um, the report is due to be published in April 2022. I can say that it, we've seen the numbers of non-harassment orders increase, which gives me confidence. Um, would it increase to the level that I'd like it to see? Um, I, I, I will take that away and look at it again. What I would ask Linda Fabiani, perhaps we can do this off, off uh, line, if she was able to provide even some of those anecdotal pieces of evidence, I'd be more than happy to take that forward uh, to my colleagues, both in the Crown uh, but uh, also, uh, of course, in the judiciary, and I must, of course, at this point, underline that decisions about non-harassment orders are, of course, ultimately for uh, the judiciary to decide on, uh, and, and I am not, uh, and would not seek to influence that. Uh, but clearly, uh, it is an area of intense focus and interest for us, and an issue that we're monitoring closely. And finally, question number eight, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will reconsider its position on holding an inquiry into the circumstances that led to the murder of Craig McClelland following the decision by the Lord Advocate not to conduct a fatal accident inquiry. Cabinet Secretary. Well, my, my, my sympathies, and I su suspect all the sim sympathies of all of us in this chamber, remain uh, with the family of Craig McClelland. I'm aware that Craig's family 
requested a full review of the decision by Lord Advocate not to hold an FEI into the circumstances of Craig's death, uh, and that has concluded that there was no basis to overturn the original decision. Uh, the decision as to whether or not to hold an FEI is, of course, uh, one solely for the Lord Advocate to take, and is a decision taken independently of government. In respect to a further inquiry that might fall to the Scottish Government to instruct, uh, as I've previously said, I don't believe that a full public inquiry uh, is appropriate. There's been a criminal prosecution, two independent reports by the inspectorates, and two follow-up reports by the independent police and prison inspectorates, which have prompted significant change and additional safeguards within the HDC regime. Neil Burby. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. No family should go through what the family of Craig McClelland have. No one should have to bear the pain of losing someone so cruelly, and no one should have to endure the intransigence of a system that is preventing them getting the answers they need. Now that the Lord Advocate has made his decision, it is down to this government and this government alone to decide whether there will be an independent public inquiry. The government have opposed an inquiry before, and they also opposed a change in the law to make fatal accident inquiries mandatory. In light of the Lord Advocate's decision, will the Cabinet Secretary reconsider uh, the Government's position today? And does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that it's difficult for people to have confidence that lessons have been fully learned if the family of Craig McClelland don't have confidence that lessons have been fully learned? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Neil Bibby for his question? I know he is uh, absolutely right to do so, of course, advocate on behalf of the family um, of, of Craig McClelland. And I have met that family, as he knows, on a number of occasions. Um, and so what I would say to Neil Bibby is actually my decision or the government's decision on a public inquiry was not necessarily related to whether or not there would be an FAI or not. That is a decision ultimately for Lord Advocate uh, to make. As I've said in my answer previous uh, to this, that there has been a criminal prosecution, uh, a number of reports looking at the HDC regime. There have been changes to the HDC regime at the time, unfortunately, of, of, of Craig's tragic uh, murder. Um, there was around about 300 people out on home detention curfew. There is now closer to around 80 people out. So the, the regime has been significantly tightened uh, in terms of home detention curfew. So the system has been improved. Uh, I remember writing to the family of Craig McClelland alongside other partners, answering, I think it was, around about 34 questions that they had to ask at the time. And if there are further questions, of course, uh, for the prison service or anybody else, then if, I'm sure the prison service, or indeed if it's for government, uh, will look to respond to those questions. But at this stage, uh, I do not think a public inquiry is needed or appropriate. Thank you very much. We now move on to questions on Constitution, Europe and External Affairs. I remind members that questions four and five and questions six and eight are grouped together. If members, other than those asking the initial questions, wish to request a supplementary question uh, on any question, they should uh, press the request to speak button in the usual way or press R in the chat box if uh, remote uh, in order to make that request. And can I call question number one, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the Scottish Information Commissioner. Minister Graham Day. Presiding Officer, as Minister for Parliamentary Business, the last discussion I had with the Commissioner was a telephone call on the 21st of May. My officials had a catch-up with the Commissioner's management team on the same day, and of course, they continue to engage with the Commissioner's office regularly. Beatrice Wishart. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Government's track record on FOI compliance was already shaky. The Information Commissioner found that different rules were applied to requests from people with a platform. And in emergency legislation, Scottish ministers tried to reduce public access to information, and staff were then taken out of the FOI, uh, sorry, out of the FOI unit. Now, transparency is more important now than ever. So, will the minister commit to comply with the legislation and fully staff the Scottish government's FOI unit? Minister, uh, presiding officer, um, the commissioner's recent report noted very clearly the improved performance of the Scottish Government in this regard. Now, Beatrice Wishart is right to say that staff from the FOI unit were redeployed to other, other areas of government. I make no apologies for that. We were and we are in a pandemic. So roughly half of the staff in that unit were deployed to other duties. They are gradually returning. We will staff up. But to be clear, 
The priority of this government is dealing with the pandemic, first and foremost. Supplementary question, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Public Audit Committee recently raised concerns that the Scottish Government is using social media, such as WhatsApp, to avoid freedom of information legislation. Can the Minister confirm to Parliament that this is not the case? Graeme Day. This is not the case. Thank you very much. Uh, question number two, uh, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what talks it has had with the EU regarding the potential impact of Brexit on Scotland's fisheries. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Now, Presiding Officer, Scottish Ministers and officials meet their EU counterparts on a regular basis to promote Scottish fishing interests and other priorities in line with the democratically expressed wishes of the people of Scotland reiterate our firm opposition to Brexit. Of particular concern is a grossly reckless no deal taken by the UK Government which would devastate the interests of the Scottish seafood sector and our coastal communities and put at risk almost £700 million worth of seafood exports to the EU. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation have said that negotiating with the EU for anything other than the UK being a fully independent coastal state would be a colossal betrayal. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that foreign affairs is a reserve matter and therefore any interference by the SNP with ongoing negotiations with the EU undermines the devolution settlement, putting Scotland's fishing industry at risk? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would, I would respond in two ways. I'm not negotiating with the EU. Every discussion I ever have, or the First Minister had or others, is predicated by that remark. But to hear a a Tory MSP talking about the undermining and gross betrayal of, uh, of anybody is rich on a day when the actions of the UK government being demonstrated at Westminster are to destroy, completely destroy the devolution settlement. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne should be apologising to this chamber, not asserting. Supplementary question, Liam MacArthur. President officers, the Cabinet Secretary should be aware that uh, Brexit poses a real threat to the ability of both the catching and the processing sectors to recruit the workers they need. Unfortunately, fishing crew do not feature in the UK immigration shortage of labour lists. So can Mr Russell uh, advise what discussions the Scottish Government is having with UK counterparts about how the pressures facing, facing the fishing sector might be met, perhaps through regional variations to allow specific needs in different parts of the UK to be met? Cabinet Secretary. The member makes a very good point, and of course, uh, the Ben McPherson, who has dealt with migration issues, I think said last week that he finds it impossible to get a discussion or a meeting with EU, with UK ministers. So that is the reality of how the UK treats the Scottish interests in these matters. The member is also right to reflect that it doesn't matter how much uh, fish you can catch. If you can't process it, if you can't sell it, if you can't get it to market, then that is irrelevant. And that is typical of the short-term thinking of Brexiteers, and particularly Brexiteers who run the UK and Scottish Conservative parties. Question number three, Liz Smith. The position is on whether the scrutiny provisions proposed for the Scottish Parliament in relation to the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill are adequate. Minister Graeme Day. Officer, the Scottish Government considers the scrutiny procedures chosen for the power in Section 1.1 of the Bill represent a good balance between allowing for effective and thorough scrutiny of the use of the power, whilst also ensuring there is sufficient flexibility to allow the Government, where appropriate, to respond quickly where legislative changes are required. Liz Smith. Uh, the Minister will be very aware that at the Finance and Constitution Committee on the 26th of August, Professor Aileen McHarg of Durham University and Professor Michael Keating of Aberdeen University both expressed their concern that between the original bill and the current bill that the default position changed from the affirmative procedure to the negative procedure. Can the Minister explain why that is the case and whether he agrees that the two witnesses um, that this change uh, reduces the scope for scrutiny out with this, sorry, within this piece of legislation? Minister. President Officer, I'm aware of a range of views on this issue. I'm certainly aware that there have been calls for an enhanced and formative procedure uh, for, to apply where provision is made 
uh, which amounts to substantial policy considerations or something similar. Um, that would be very difficult to operate in practice, given how subjective that test is and how difficult it would be to define. Applying it would effectively involve a subjective assessment of whether any provision meets the test. And that could open the door uh, to speculative legal challenges, where it could be argued that a different procedure should have applied. So what we have is, we think, a, an appropriate and proportionate workable, effective solution here. And I, I hear the Conservatives disagree. They have every right to disagree, and they can disagree during the committee process. Uh, but, President Officer, we believe that what we have is a pragmatic and practical uh, approach to this solution, and I look forward to the parliamentary scrutiny of this issue. Question number four, Maurice Golden. Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether, following the end of the transition period, it will want Scotland to keep pace with all new EU laws. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It will not be possible to align with every new EU law. Some will only operate properly in the EU itself, and some will be in reserved areas. And there may be practical or resource constraints in relation to others. But we do intend to seek the closest relationship possible with the EU, and the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill will provide the basis to do this by secondary legislation. We will seek to align wherever it makes sense for Scotland to do so, because we share the values set out in the Treaty on European Union, which are respect for human dignity, respect for human rights, freedom, equality, democracy and the rule of law. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Based on current structures, what formal role will the Scottish Government have in influencing the direction or content of future EU laws? Jenny Gilruth. Can I say to Maurice Golden that he should remember what our constituents voted for in 2016? They did not vote to leave the European Union. They did not vote for a paragraph from Westminster on this Parliament's powers. They did not vote for a Tory government, and nor have they endorsed a hard Brexit. The Scottish Government will fight to maintain Scotland's international reputation in the teeth of a government who are now intent on, by their own admission, breaking international law. Deciding officer, it is clear that the continuity bill threatens the Tories. So terrified are they that they would, we would dare seek to rejoin the European Union. But rejoin we will, and in the meantime, we will keep pace the high international best practice standards represented by EU law, because that is what the people of this country voted for, and Morris Golden should remember that. That is grouped with question number five, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role it will have in influencing the direction or content of future EU laws that it plans to keep pace with under the terms of its EU conti continuity bill. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has always had to work hard at influencing EU laws in less formal ways as it was with uh, the UK, which was, of course, the Member State. To that end, Scottish Government officials and ministers will continue to engage with their counterparts where possible. Mr Lockhart, however, raises a very relevant and a welcome point. The best way to influence the direction and content of future EU laws is to be a full, equal, independent member of the EU. The partnership approach of the EU is in clear contrast to the utter contempt that this Westminster Tory government colleagues continue to display towards the people of Scotland, which is one of the reasons why support for independence is now the majority position in Scotland. Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. In her response, the Minister talks about a separate Scotland joining the EU. Does the Minister therefore plan to keep pace with the EU Stability Pact, which requires Member States to have a budget deficit of no more than 3% of GDP? If so, can the Minister explain where the £10 billion of spending cuts will be made in Scotland in order to keep pace with this fiscal requirement? Given now that under the SNP, Scotland has the highest fiscal deficit of any Western economy. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Presiding officer, the Continuity Bill does not require Scotland to align with any or all of the measures. It instead allows us to assess on a case-by-case -case basis and applying our judgment and common sense whether aligning would be in Scotland's best interest or not. So democratic accountability will always remain with Scottish Parliament. And in assessing whether or not to align with any given EU measure, we will look at a range of factors such as the practical implications, economic and social benefits, and the cost, resource implications, and any impact on Scotland's future re-accession to the EU. But the premise of Mr Lockhart's question is how can Scotland best have influence? And as I have told him, the answer to that question is as a full, equal and independent member of the EU. Supplementary question, Alex Rowley. 
The, the Tories seem to be having a good chuckle to themselves there on the issue of Brexit. But can I ask, can I ask the Minister, I speak to many people, many constituents, who are concerned that we are looking at much reduced environmental standards, poorer food standards. Are they right to be concerned? Minister Jenny Gouders. Thank Ali Riley for that uh, supplementary. He is absolutely correct that our constituents um, have extreme reservations about this. I don't know about his inbox, but I have been inundated by concerned constituents um, who are worried about food standards, for example. Um, they are right to be concerned about this. This is um, a power grab on the Scottish Parliament's powers. We have made it clear that the Scottish Government is not going to stand for it and we will challenge it and work against these measures at every opportunity possible. And in terms of the continuity bill, what this allows us to do is to keep pace with these high standards. And this is not something the Conservatives should be threatened by, unless, of course, they don't want to keep us aligned to these high standards. Question number six, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the UK's proposed UK General Market Bill will take powers away from Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Yes, there is no doubt about that. The legislation is fundamentally inconsistent with the devolution settlements and their operations since 1999. They would centralise power in the UK government and UK parliament, cut across devolved powers by imposing a blanket constraint on devolution and on the democratically elected members here. It reserves state aid and it would give UK ministers sweeping new powers to allocate funding in devolved areas in Scotland without the oversight or consent of anybody in Scotland. UK ministers talk about a power surge to devolved administrations, but it is very misleading. The powers that the UK has listed are already devolved. The bill makes it clear that state aid is to be removed from being a devolved power to become a reserved power. It also grants greater powers for UK ministers to bypass devolved decision making. This bill is, without a doubt, the biggest threat to devolution since 1999, and we will vigorously oppose it at every turn and in every way possible. More than what? I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very full and clear answer. The European single market rules recognise and allow for policy objectives alongside market economic considerations, such as the health benefits of minimum unit pricing. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise whether the Scottish Government has received any con confirmation that this would be the case under the UK Government's internal market plans? And if not, is he concerned about what may happen under this legislation when the minimum unit price comes up for review? Michael Russell. I think it's absolutely clear that any and all of the decisions of the Scottish Parliament uh, can be overturned or undermined by the internal market legislation. I noticed evidence being given uh, to the Finance and Constitution Committee this morning regarding taxation. Um, the uh, Tory members are sitting in the, in the chamber giggling away at themselves uh, because they know that their jacket is on a sugarly nail on these matters. And they know perfectly well that the people of Scotland are looking at them and looking at them at people who now wish to damage and destroy the very institution to which people in Scotland elected them. They will not take that kindly. That is grouped with question number eight, Ruth Maguire. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest engagement has been with the UK Government regarding the UK Internal Market Bill. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Uh, at a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on the 3rd of September, I made very clear the Scottish Government's opposition to the UK Government's initial internal market proposals and called for them to withdraw in the light of significant concern raised by members of this Parliament and stakeholders across Scotland in a, cons uh, in a consultation, the results of which the UK Government has not been prepared to publish. Since the bill was published, we've continued to make clear our intention to oppose the bill in every way possible. Following this, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Fair Work and Culture wrote to Alex Sharma, setting out in detail the economic grounds in which we consider the provisions of the bill to be unnecessary. The letter highlighted the way in which the mutual recognition model set out in the bill cuts across the democratic choices of devolved parliaments and raised serious concerns about the way future trade deals made by the UK could impact on lower standards. It's already been indicated by the UK dropping public health priorities in pursuit of a trade deal with Japan. We've been clear with the UK government that the Common Frameworks programme that we have engaged in in good faith over the past two years are, is what is needed to manage the practical and regulatory impact of the UK leaving the EU, as was always envisaged. 
and the proposals that are being put forward by the UK government instead present, as I have said, a significant threat to devolution and to the roles and responsibilities of this parliament and the Scottish government and to the everyday lives and expectations of the people of Scotland. Ruth Maguire. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Widely and correctly, this bill is seen as incompatible with devolution, bad for business and consumers, dangerous for the environment and an impediment to necessary and effective devolved public health measures. What action will the Scottish Government take to stop the Conservative Government in London unilaterally and arbitrarily imposing its will on Scotland against the wishes of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish citizens who sent us here? The bill is being vigorously opposed. The bill, sorry, presiding officer. The bill is being vigorously proposed at, at Westminster in the House of Commons. Um, it, it would be good to think that all elective Scottish representatives were standing up for Scotland, and therefore one could look across the chamber at the Scottish Conservatives and say, "Are they prepared to stand up and defend devolution?" Alas, you know, they will be found wanting, regrettably, in that matter. When it goes to the House of Lords, we expect that there will be vigorous opposition, and Lords, not least because the the bill also breaches uh, international law, and that is admitted by the UK government. And then we have not ruled out other action, will not rule out other actions, because this bill is wrong and should not pass. And we will do everything we can to make sure that it does not pass, and everything to we can to make sure that it does not come into effect, and everything we can to make sure it does not undermine the will of the Scottish people. And finally, question number seven, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it is having with the UK Government regarding the EU exit trade negotiations. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Standing officer, the Scottish Government has frequent discussions at official and official level with the UK Government in relation to the EU exit negotiations, as I have said earlier. But despite the Scottish Government's best efforts since the beginning of the Brexit process, the UK Government continues to refuse meaningful engagement, which is needed to ensure that the UK position identifies protects and promotes Scotland's interests. Given the way the UK government has consistently ignored the wishes and interests of the people of Scotland, including the extraordinary decision to end the transition period during a global pandemic, the case for Scotland becoming an independent, equal member of the EU, as my friend Jenny Gilruth has said this afternoon, has never been stronger, nor has it ever been better supported in Scotland. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the UK Government has shown complete contempt for the devolved nations and that the actions of the Tories are hugely damaging to Scotland's interests and threatening to our economy? Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. I cannot, I cannot presenting officer, think of a better statement to end the session with. I agree entirely with it. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Alex Rowley, please. Presiding officer, we also heard that the Finance and Constitution Committee this morning that there is a real threat of future trade bills uh, where we have a situation where the NHS in Scotland and other public services could be included. Uh, given that, that level of threat, uh, will the Cabinet Secretary make representations to the UK Government because this is just another threat to devolution? Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. I have to say uh, to Mr Rowley, you bet I will. I make those representations all the time and will continue to make them. It is without doubt, despite what the UK Conservative government says or the Scottish Conservatives say, this is a major threat to devolution and there is nothing this, that the Scottish Parliament is doing that is not threatened by it. And it is certainly more than likely that public services like the National Health Service will be assaulted by this bill. Thank you very much. That concludes portfolio questions. My apologies to the members earlier who were uh, not able to be called, uh, and we will move on shortly to the next item of business.